Chapter 8 For once, the printing press was silent. Though Lieutenant Dallas had always considered the constant clattering of the machine to be a source of much cursed irritation, now it was idle. He found the sound of its silence filled him with dread. Sitting at his desk in the claustrophobic confines of his clattered office, he looked across the fractured glass at the top half of the portion wall, separating him from the print room, and felt his stomach churn in anxiety as he watched the militia auxiliaries who made up his staff go about their labors. neighbors. The aged caretakers, Kern and Von Tank, were busy maintaining the ancient parts of the press itself. Kern oiling the machine's rollers, while Von Tex topped off the ink reservoir, ready for the next edition. Nearby, head bobbing, and his face moved in involuntary ticks, the feeble-minded cripple, Shulin, stumbled past them with a broom, flailing spasmodically in his hands as he attempted to sweep the floor. Only the composer, Fern, was without a task. His features pitched an expression somewhere between acceptancy and annoyance. He stood beside the empty expanse of the typesetting board and gazed back toward Dallas through the glass. Then, seeing he had met the lieutenant's eyes, Fearn raised a hand to point at the chronometer hanging above the printing press in a gesture of mute excusion. Accusation. Fifteen hundred hours, Dallas thought, his heart sinking, and his eyes followed the direction of Farron's bony finger to glance at the chronometer. We only have an hour now before I have to deliver the late edition to Kamazar Valk for approval. A single hour. I must find something to write. Anything. Despairing, Dallas returned his attention to the dozens of official papers piled in confusion across his desk. Among the jumbled mess of documents before him were copies of situation reports, battlefield dispatches, casualty statistics, task communicates, calm transcripts, between them comprising a record of every event of consequence that had happened in the city of Brucek in the past twelve hours. Despite what seemed like hours now spent surveying the assembled weight of information before him, Dallas had found nothing there to suit his purpose. There is no good news to report, he thought bleakly. Today the same as every other day. There is only bad news, and I cannot print that. The commissar will have me shot on the spot. His thoughts drifted back to the day two years previously when he had first heard the news that he was being posted to an imposing office of the General Headquarters building in the center of Briochek. At first, sure, he was going to be rewarded with a staff assignment. He had rejoiced. Then, when they brought him to the dingy basement print room to tell him it would be his task to produce a twice-daily newsletter and propaganda sheet for the edification of the city's defenders. His heart had thrilled even more. It had seemed the answer to all his prayers, a staff and office of his own, and more importantly, a prestigious assignment, a pre prestigious assignment that would keep him far from the fighting. He had soon learned, however, that the lot in life of the official propagandist was rarely a happy one, even less so when it was his duty to put a brave face to the conflict as prone to sudden reverses and unimaginative disasters as was the war in Briochek. We are losing this war, he thought, so lost in the depths of his own misery now that he was barely aware of any wider implication. We are losing this war. That is the reality, and yet I have to barely, in an hour, to find some small piece of good news. 
that will allow the newsletter to print to pretend otherwise. One hour. It just can't be done. I need more time. Hearing the sound of his office door opening, Dallas looked up to see Solon shuffling through the doorway. Mouth working soundlessly, his body twitching in uncontrollable pulses. Solon taltered toward him with a wastebasket in his hands, an ugly scar left by the orc bullet that addled his brain, clearly visible in his temple. What is this, Solon? Dallas sighed. K -k 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 Cleaning! Solon said, stammering out a spray of spittle as he stopped to start, shoveling the papers littering Dallas' desk into the wastebasket. Aggravated for a moment, Dallas idly wondered if there were any way of making Solon bear the blame for his problems. I could tell Kamazar Valk that it was all Solon's fault, he thought. That we were just padding the finished touches to the latest edition when Solon banished into the typeson board, knocking into the floor and destroying all of our work. <laughs> if the Kamazar decides to shoot the useless oaf in retribution, I, for one, would not miss him. Just as quickly as he realized the plan to work, the other members of the staff would have supported his story. Fair and the others would not wear it. They had always protected Solon, coddling him like some idiot child, and would be sure to oppose any attempt to make him the significant sacrificial goat. Then abruptly, Dallas caught a glimpse of the words written on one of the crumpled pieces of paper in Solon's hand, and knew he finally had an answer. Stop that! He snapped at Solon, reaching out with a metal ruler to wrap at his knuckles. Leave the wastebasket here, and go tell Farron I'll have a copy for tonight's edition ready for him in fifteen minutes. F f f f fifteen minutes, Dallas said retrieving the paper he had seen in Solon's hand, and smoothing out the creases so he could read it. Now get out of my sight! It was a contract report, reporting an orc assault in Sector 113 two and a half hours earlier. What interested Dallas more was the attached account of the event that had prestaged the assault. A single lander bearing a company's worth of battlefield replacements, had crashed into no man's land. Reading it, Dallas realized it was exactly what he had been looking for. Granted, the course of events would need a little rewriting to keep Kamazov Valk happy. What had been an entirely futile waste of human life would need to become a resounding victory. All the basic substance of what he needed was there already. He would only have to change the details in the events in Sector 113. It should suit his purposes ad admirably. Yes. This is exactly what I needed, Dallas thought, quickly running through a series of potential headlines in his head. Enemy assault defeated by landing form from space. A sector-wide breakthrough. Orcs retreating in disarray. And the hairs raising on the back of his neck, he thought of a new headline and knew he had cracked it. Orcs defeated in Sector 113. Jamal 14th victorious. Smiling, Dallas picked up the stylus and began to write a glowing report of the battle, carefully embroidering the account with a variety of the stock words and phrases he had developed over the years in the course of his duties. Heroic resistance, brave and resolute defense, a triumph of faith and righteous fury over Xeno's savagery. Occasionally, as he paused to construct some new sentences full of rhetorical zeal and fire, he felt the vague stirrings of his conscience troubling him, but he pushed it aside and ignored it. It was not his fault he was forced to lie and twist the facts, he told himself. The truth was always the first casualty in warfare. As an information officer, sometimes it was his task to be creative. To do otherwise would be to risk offending aid and comfort the enemy. Yes, 
It was a matter of duty. And after all, it was important to do everything humanly possible to keep the morale of the troops. A fire. Devar said, as I sat in the firing trench. That's all I would like to see. A fire to burn down General Headquarters. And torch all the stupid bastards inside it. If another blaze would somehow be ignited at Sector Command as well, then... <laughs> All the better. It wouldn't be that difficult. Give me a grenade launch on a couple of phosphorus rounds. I'll have both damn places on fire in no time. Appalled, Lon listened in disbelieving silence. In the first half an hour since they had reached their trench, Deva's constant stream of complaints had slowly given way to extended musings, which he had openly discussed methods of killing the general staff responsible for the progress of Briochek campaign. No, even more extraordinary to Lan's mind was the fact that the other men of the trench had simply sat there and listened to it, as though it was the most normal thing in the world to talk lightly of mutiny and sedition. As Deva's monologue wore on, Lan found himself with fewer and fewer doubts as to the reasons why the war in the city seemed to be going so badly, if these men responded in represent of cross-section of the city's defenders. Of course, I accept it will be difficult getting close enough to use a grenade launcher, David continued. What with the security parameters around both buildings being so heavily patrolled and defended, but I've already foreseen a solution. It's only a matter of sealing the right credentials. And I can be inside the perimeter and killing the members of the general staff before they can even project justice. These men can't be guardsmen, Lon thought, as he looked at the faces of the four men sitting around him in the trench. Granted, they fought off the orc attack well enough two hours ago, but where's their discipline? Their devotion to the Emperor... Is it as though all the traditions and regulations of the guard mean nothing to them? How can they just sit there and listen to this man spew treason without taking action? You would never get away with it, Deva. The Verdun sitting opposite Deva said. A tall, thin man with his mid-thirties. His name was Scholar. Or at least that's what the others called him. Whether it was a profession or a simple nickname. Given his stoop shouldered built, and the owlish cast on his face, the name seemed to fit him. I'm afraid it was a question of there being major flaws in your modius apprehende, Scholar said, fingers playing unoccasionally on his chin, as though stroking a non-existent beard. Even granting that you managed to obtain the necessary credentials, I doubt the parameter guards will be willing to stand idly by while you shoot grenades at their generals willy-nilly. There are rules in the guard against wasting ammunition, after all. Besides, even if you could somehow elude the guards, you can be sure that the buildings housing General HQ and Sector Command have both been extensively fireproofed. Not to mention equipped with damage control systems, blast shields, extinguishing devices, and so forth. No, Deva. I think you will have to find some other method of getting your tally. Could they be joking somehow? Lon thought. Is that it? Is this all some kind of joke to them? Intended to do more than help them pass the time? By the... Uh, talking about murdering officers. How could anyone mistake that for a laughing matter? Then I'll simply have to seize control of the artillery battery. Deva said. A few high explosive rounds aimed at the GHQ building. And I should kill a few generals at least. But you wouldn't want to do that either. The third one. Balian. Said earnestly. A hulking figure with a thick neck, brawny arms, and a broad, bearish build. Belvin was the fire team's heavy weapons specialist. He also seemed the only man among the group to harbor anything in the way of concern 
or the lives of his superiors. If you start killing generals, Deva, who will we have left to give us orders? You talk as though it's a bad thing, big brain, Deva spat. It is thanks to those assholes in General HQ and their orders that we are in this mess to begin with. Not that I expect us to suddenly starting magically winning this war when they're all dead, you understand. Killing them would make it any much more worse. At least doing it would give me some small amount of satisfaction. Orders. <laughs> As though they achieved anything with all their damned orders other than making things ten times worse. You want to know about orders? Ask Ripzik. If it hadn't been for some fool ordering battery command to withhold artillery support in the last attack, he'd probably still be alive. For that matter, what about our new friend here? You all saw what happened to the lander earlier. Ask the new fish what he thinks about orders that sent him halfway across the galaxy just to make landfall on the wrong fracking planet. Abruptly, the other men in the trench turned to look towards him. Fully aware, he must have looked like a rabbit caught in the searchlights of an oncoming vehicle. Lon could only gop back at them, unsure of what to say. Perhaps he's still in shock, Bolivin said, his tone salacious. Is that it, Nefish? You in shock? Wetting his pants in fear, more like, Zebes, the fourth man of the trench said, thin and wiry, of average build. Zebes looked younger than the others, perhaps in his mid-twenties, where Deva and the rest were in their early to mid-thirties. Red-haired and pitted and pockmark face. Zebes looked nastily towards Lan and sneered at him. Look at him. If his skin was any grayer, you wouldn't be able to see him against the mud. He asked me he's afraid. If he says what he really thinks, some comers I will hear him and have him shot. <laughs> Not much to be worried about that score, Deva said. You hear me, new fish? You could speak freely. Granted, time was... Uh, we'd be getting Kamazars coming to line to lead attacks and so forth. Thankfully, our friends, the Orcs, soon paid to that. Any Kamazar who was crazy enough to want to join the frontline combat unit got himself killed long ago. The Kamazars left now tend to be those with sharper instinct for their own survival. Sharp enough to stay away from the front line. At any rate. So come on, then. You must have some opinion. Let us hear it. Yes, indeed, said Scholar. I, for one, would be fascinated to know what you think. Come on, the fish, Zeba said, his tone harsh and goading. What are you waiting for? Gritch got your tongue. Don't rush him, Bolvin said more kindly. Like I say, I think he's still in shock. I'm sure he'll tell us in time. Faces expectant, the guardsmen fell quiet as they waited for Lan to answer. Uncomfortable, painfully aware of the four pairs of eyes staring at him in silence. For a moment, Lan could only sit there with his mouth open, the words dying on his tongue before he could even say them. Then thinking about all he had seen and heard in the last few hours, in a voice thick and with misery, he gave them the only answer he had. Uh, I don't understand any of this, he said at last. None of it. Nothing that happened to me so far today seems to make any sense. What's there they understand, new fish? Deva said. We are stuck in this damned city. We're surrounded by millions of orcs. Every day, they try to kill us. We try not to let them succeed. End of story. A concise summary granted, Deva. Scholar had said next. Though you omitted the mention the Prometheum and the stalemate, not to mention some of the wider parameters. 
Fine, scholar. Deva had shrugged. I think you're wasting your time. But you tell him all about it, then. While you're at it, you might as well tell him how to go about brushing his teeth and wiping his backside. After all, I wouldn't like to see the consequences that the new fish here somehow got those two vital functions mixed up. Whatever you do, do it from the firing step. It is still your turn to stand watch. And remember, just because we have to nursemaid a war virgin doesn't mean the orcs have forgotten they want to kill us. You see them? Scholar said a few minutes later. Standing, pointing out to no man's land from the firing step next to Lan, while Deva and the others sat playing a card game on the trench floor below them. That dark grey ragged line about 800 meters away. That's the orc lines. Though, looking through the field glass Scholar had lent him, Lan followed the direction of the tall man's pointing finger to stare into the wasteland before them. There, he saw it. A sinuous line of ditches that ran the entire length of the sector on the outer line of No Man's Land. Watching it, form a line to time, he saw a Gretchen or Orc head suddenly come into view, only for the head to then swiftly disappear as it opener dropped out of sight below the parpets on the Orc side once more. I don't understand how I didn't see it before, Lon said. Having the field glasses helps, but it seems clear now. How could we have missed it? It's a question of perception, Scholar said. You have noticed how grey the landscape is, yes. The mud, the rocks, the sky, even the buildings. When a person first arrives here, the details of the world about them can hmm, be easily lost in the same monotonous tone of grey. But there are subtle differences, differences you become slowly aware of the longer you spend in the city. Have you heard of some jungle wilders, forty different worlds of full green? In reality, of course, those forty worlds correspond to different shades of green. Shades which would all look the same to us. But to them, the perceptions heightened by living their entire lives in a green environment. The difference between each shade is obvious in the difference between black and white. It is the same here in Briochek. Believe me, you'll be amazed how acute you become to the palette of greys once you've been in the city for a few months. Of course, he continued, delighted to finally have an audience willing to hear a lecture. Normally, you wouldn't be able to miss the orc lines if you tried. There'd be an array of makeshift walls, dirt, ramparts, and boss poles stretching from one side of the sector to the other. Our piles of burnt-out vehicles and corpses used in place of sandbags... The details differ from sector to sector. Up to a mouth ago, up to a month ago, we were stationed in sector 111. There, the orcs used these large, jerry-rigged barricades that they would just smash their way through whenever they attacked us. Then they would rebuild them, smashing their way through them again whenever there was a major assault, and so on. You see, the orcs don't follow a centralized command structure as we do. Granted, when their war bosses were not busy fighting it out amongst each other, they are usually united behind a single warlord. But when it comes to the disposition of any particular orc sector, the local war boss is free to do as he wants. And, as it happens, this particular boss seems to have taken a leaf out of our book ordering his followers to dig camouflaged underground dugouts, foxholes, and trenches rather than the usual ostentatious fortress. It could be his brighter-than-usual orc leader. Then again, perhaps he's just aping our tactics without any kind of clear plan in mind. Really, it can be hard to tell with orcs. Even after ten years here, I still find it difficult to tell the difference between a stupid orc and a clever one. 
You've been here ten years as well? Lon said. I could barely believe it when Ribzak said he'd been here that long. We all have. Me, Deva, Borvin, Valak, Chakla, Sivik, Kale. All the men in the company have. The ones from Virden, anyhow, of course. There are plenty of replacements, like you and Zebers, who have been here considerably less time. Zebers isn't from Verden. Him? <laughs> no. I say he is a replacement. Joined us about um, two months ago, give or take. What about the rest of the regiment? Are there many replacements among them as well? The rest? You misunderstand me, Nifish. Scholar said sadly. Company Alpha is the Verden 9 second. 900 second. We're all that's left among the Verdens here. The others are dead. You mean your regiment was wiped out? Lon said, horrified. Out of an entire regiment, only 200 men are still alive. <laughs> Worse than that, new fish. There were three Verden regiments when we first sat down in Birocek. But over time, we suffered heavy losses. We lost the Verdun 722 in our first week here, wiped out when General HQ ordered one of the now-famous all-out assaults on the Orc lines. The survivors were... imbomangated into the Verdun 931st, who in turn eventually became part of the 902nd, and then over the years... There are more casualties, and the number of companies in the 902nd were reduced to... ambligated. Until now, only Company Alpha is left. At least... count, I believe. Our current fighting strength is somewhere in the order of 244 men. Perhaps three quarters of whom from Verden. Something like 180 or so Verdens left from the more than 6,000 men who first made Planetfall in the city ten years ago. Really is not so different from your situation with your own former company. It is a matter of attrition, you see. It is the same for the other guard regiment in the city, of course. Having been on the front line so long, it had it worse than most. I doubt there's a regiment left in this city that is, any more than 30% of its original strength. This is Briochek here. Anything and everything is a matter of attrition. But then, given the name of the place, it is hardly surprising. The name? Lon asked, still stunned by the thought that the men he saw about him were all that was left from 6,000 guardsmen. <laughs> Yes, a while back we spent a month dug in at the old bombed-out building that turned out to be a storage facility for some of the city's oldest archives. I managed to read some of them before Deva and the rest used them for toilet paper. In the days before it became a city, the name of this place was Butcher's Rock, or Boyersher's Rook in the local planetary dialect. Over time, in the city grew, its name was corrupted to the pronunciation we know now. Bur Sher Yok. Bersherok. As for the order of the name, apparently the first settlement to be founded here served as the center for the planet's meat trade. Of course, it still does, in a matter of speaking. Still does. Lon said. I don't understand what you mean. It means the whole damn city is one big meat grinder, new fish. David growled from the bottom of the trench. And we are the meat. You should tell the new fish about Prometheum, Scholar. Bolvin said from beside him. It's better if he knows what we're fighting for. Ah, yes, the Prometheum, Scholar said, taking the field glasses back from Lon and placing them in a case on his belt. That is the battle here is about, more or less. Then nodding toward Deva, he added, 
Of course, I'm sure if you ask Deva, he would tell you the war here is only about survival. Which would be right as well, but you cannot understand the broader axis of strategy here without knowing something about the Prometheum. Strategy, my bird verdant ass, Deva said. What does strategy mean to us? You think a man cares about strategy when he feels an orc blade go through his gut? You and Baldwin are fooling yourselves, scholar. What you think of it? wasn't for the Mimetheum and the Orcs would just go away. If that were the case, I'd have found some way to give it to them myself by now. Never mind all the fantasizing about killing generals. You make things too complicated, scholar. The Orcs want to kill us for one simple reason. They're Orcs. And that is all there is to it. And by all means, tell the new fish about your grand theories. I'm sure they'll come in very handy next time the bullets start flying, and he finds himself face to face with a horde of screaming greenskins. Though from what I've seen already, you might be doing him more of a favor if you told him to tie a string around his belt and tie the other end to his last gun, so he doesn't lose it again. Grimacing in dismissive annoyance, David returned his attention to the card game, leaving Scholar to go on with his lecture. <clears throat> the Prometheum new fish, Scholar said. That's why the orcs are here, and that's what makes this city important to both us and them. Remember, I told you this city started off as a center for the meat trade. Well, that was thousands of years ago. In more recent times, Burrock, or Brioshock became a center for the planet's Prometheum industry. Time was when the city was little more than one giant refinery, where crude Prometheum would be brought from drilling fields further south to be refined into fuel. Even though the pipelines that brought that crude here were cut long ago, the city is still rich in Prometheum. Billions of barrels worth stored in massive underground tanks, underlying most of the city. But what do the orcs want with it? Lon asked. Fuel, Scholar said. Ten years ago was just the first made landfall here. It looked like the orcs were going to conquer this entire planet, until they started to run out of fuel for their armor. When that happened, they laid siege to Briorok hoping to seize the city's fuel reserves, but we managed to hold out. And without fuel, the orcs' assault elsewhere on the planet simply ground to a halt. Ever since then, it had been a stalemate, with us trapped inside the city and the orcs outside it trying to get in. A stalemate that shows no sign of ending any time soon. But what about the Imperial forces in the other part of the planet? Don said. Or even Imperial forces from off-world. Why haven't they tried to relieve the siege? As for the Imperial forces elsewhere on this planet, it could be that they have tried to relieve us, New Fish. Scholar said. Certainly. If you ask General HQ, they would tell you... The city is on the verge of being relieved. Mm. <laughs> However... Seeing as they have been saying the same thing for ten years now, no one much believes them anymore. You'll find that here in Birorok, our commanders tell us a lot of things. That we're winning the war, the orcs are leaderless and on the verge of collapse, and the big breakthrough they have been promising us for the last ten years is finally imminent. You'll find that after a while, hearing the same old things day in after day, you simply learn to not listen. For myself, I suspect that our brother guardsmen and other parts of the Emperor Forsaken World are in no better shape than we are. Not that I can say definitely whether or not this is the case, you understand, given that the only part of this planet I have ever seen is Birorok. As theories go, however, it seems no worse than any other. But of course, that doesn't fully answer your question, now does it? Scholar said. 
fully lost now in the flow of his own erudition. As to why Imperial forces from off-world don't intervene, I suspect the war here is simply not important enough to justify a full-scale landing. From time to time, there are similar, more isolated landings, by a, a lander, say, or a single dropship, but nothing that could be mistaken for anything even resembling a real attempt to break the siege. Sometimes in the case of you and your company, these landings turn out to be simple mistakes. Other times, it is though some distinct bureaucrat has finally decided to send us a few more troopers or supplies in order to rescue us. To reassure us and um, make sure we have not been forgotten. For the most part, these occasional drops are as pointless and ridiculous as every other aspect of life here in Bidorok. In the past, we have been sent entire pods full of supplies, only to find when we fought our way to them, the boxes inside the pods were full of most useless things imaginable. Paper clips, mosquito netting, laxative, uh, boot laces, and the rest is so on. You know, battle dresses and whatever. <laughs> Remember when they sent us an entire drop pod full of condoms? Davis said from nearby. I could never decide whether they wanted us to use them as barrage balloons, or simply thought the orcs had a fear of rubber. <laughs> a good example of what I was talking about, Scholar said. But anyways, I think that pretty much covers everything for now, new fish. Do you have any questions? Never mind his questions, Zebus said suddenly looking up from his cards to gaze at Lon with a sly and malignant smile. He didn't quite cover everything for the new fish scholar. There's still one thing you forgot to tell them. Forgot? Scholar said. Really? I don't think there's anything else of importance. Yes, there is, Zebra said, staring at Lon now with cold malice. You forgot to tell him why it was Deva said you'd be wasting your time telling the new fish anything. Why well, all the things you told him already are probably totally useless to him. Why, well, come tomorrow there's likely only going to be four men in this trench, not five. Oh yes, I think you forgot to tell him something, scholar. You forgot to tell him the single most important thing of them all. For a moment, Zabers paused, the silence growing tense and ugly as he stared at Lon, while the other shifted uneasily in the positions, as though suddenly uncomfortable. Then the corners of his lips rising tightly in a gloating smile of victory. Zabers smirked at Lon and spoke once more. You forgot to tell him about fifteen hours. They're quiet at first. Scholar and Balvin looked down at the ground in apparent embarrassment, while even Deva avoided Lon's eyes as though feeling the same vague sense of discomfort as the others. Only Zabers looked his way, staring back at him. Lon found himself parry to an unwelcome insight. Zabers hated him. Though why, or for whatever reason, he could not even begin to guess. What is this fifteen hours? Don said, at least, to break the silence. Ripsek said something about it just before the last attack, and Corporal Vadek mentioned it as well. He said he would issue me with more equipment if I came back to see him again in fifteen hours' time. Long moments passed, and no one answered. And said there was only more silence while Deva, Scholar, and Balvin looked uneasily at one another, as a mentally drawing lots to decide which of them would perform an unwelcome duty. Until at length, still refusing to meet Lon's eyes, Deva finally spoke. Tell him, Scholar. In response, Scholar fidgeted for a moment before, clearing his throat. He turned to face Lon directly. It's a matter of the statistics, Newfish. 
scholar said with a pained expression. You must understand that in any ways, every marshal and general at headquarters is as much as a bureaucrat as the most fanatic scribe in the administratum. To them, war is not just a thing of blood and death, nor entirely a question of tactics and strategy. To them, as much of anything a matter of calculation, a calculation based on casualty reports, rate of attrition, the numbers of units in the field, estimates of the enemy strength, and so on. All the myriad facts and figures that together can be used to establish a mathematic of slaughter. Every day, from all over Burchak, Birok, <clears throat> my bad, these figures are recorded, collected, and sent to general headquarters for the bean counters there to work on them. As for this fifteen hours that Zebra's mentioned, it is the one that predicts these daily calculations. You're overcomplicating things again, Scholar, Davis said. It does no good to sugar the pill for the new fish. He asked a direct question. You should answer him accordingly. It is a matter of life expectancy, new fish. Scholar sighed. Fifteen hours is the average length of time a replacement guardsman survives in Birok, after he had been posted in a combat unit for the front lines. A replacement guardsman, Lon said, still unsure whether he fully understood what Scholar had just told him. Like me, you mean? Is that what you're telling me? That That's how long you expect me to survive here? You think I'm going to be dead inside fifteen hours? Less than that, new fish. Zebus said, his tone smug and mocking. You must have been here at least three hours by now, leaving only twelve left. Maybe less. What do you think Valak told you to return him in fifteen hours? He didn't want to risk wasting a lot of good equipment on a dead man. Shut up, Zabers. Belden rumbled. For a moment, Zabers glared back at him until seeing the angry expression on the big man's face. He dropped his eyes down at the mud of the trench floor in sullen silence. Tell him that isn't the way it is, Scholar. Belden began again, his expression softening and his voice almost pleading. Explain it to him. Tell him. We have every faith. He will still be alive tomorrow. What do you think we should lie to him? Davis said to Bolvin. Zabers here may be an evil little shite with a big mouth, but at least he's telling the truth. You think we could treat the new fish like a child? Done everything will be alright, and his kindly old uncles Dava and Scholar and Bovin will keep him safe from the mean and nasty orcs. Even after ten years of your fat-headed stupidity, you never cease to amaze me, Bovin. You wouldn't be lying, Dava, Bovin said sulkily. There's nothing wrong with giving men some hope. Hope my arse, Diffa spat. I keep telling you, fat man, hope is a binch of bloody claws. You think after ten years in this damned hellhole, you would have learned that lesson by now at least. All the same. All the same, Balvin is not entirely wrong, Scholar said, turning towards the others to join the discussion. The new fish does indeed have some small cause for hope. True. General HQ may have calculated the life expectancy of replacement to be 15 hours, but that is only an average figure. Perhaps the new fish would be more fortunate. He could survive longer. He had already beaten the odds once already by surviving that landing. Pah! <laughs> Sometimes, scholar, you could be as bad as Bulvin, Deva said. But where he withers on about hope and optimism, you act like you're still in the schoolroom. You'd do better to remind yourself we are in the real world here. 
Your talk of odds and averages and innumerable bullshit is all very well. But this is bitter, Rook. It doesn't matter what the new fish survived the landing, any more than it matters whether or not you and Bovin try to coddle him. He is as good as a corpse already. A dead man walking. Trust me. The orcs will see to that. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like... There's nothing they like more than new fish still wet behind the ears and ready for the gutting. All I'm saying is that we perhaps being too little-minded when it comes to talking about this figure 15 hours, Scholar said. All three of them so caught up in the heat of their argument now that they ignored Lon as he stood there listening to them. It is not an absolute figure. It is only average. Why, for all we know, the new fish might end up surviving days, weeks, maybe even years. Years, Deva said. You know you really are a wonder to me, scholar. I've never seen a man talk so eloquently at such length from his ass before. You think the new fish is going to manage to survive years in this place? Next you'll be telling me you expect Steck the command to make Bolvin a general. You obviously haven't seen the new fish in action. Stop it. Lon said quiet. No longer willing to be talked about as though he was invisible. I've heard enough. Stop calling me New Fish. My name is Lan. For a moment, as though surprised by the interception, the other men in the trance simply blinked and turned to look at him in silence. What? You don't like us calling us calling you New Fish then? Davos said after a time. Sarcastically, of course. Have we offended you, perhaps? Are your feelings hurt? No, said Don, uncertainly. I, I, I don't understand. I just think you should use my name as all. Well. My real name. I mean, Lon, not New Fish. Really? Davis said, gazing at him with cold eyes while Zabers glared at him in hostility. And Skola and Bovin looked at him in sadness. Then it is you who does not understand the facts of life here, new fish. You think I care about what your name is? I have enough baggage in my hand already. Never mind learning something like that will likely be written on a grave marker before the day is out. You want me to remember your name? Tell me it again in fifteen hours' time. Then, perhaps it'll be worth knowing. All right, that's going to do it for another video. Let me cut to straight to the chase and say thank you to ongoing Patreon supporters. Cocoa, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown 480, Eldrick Madrid, Fortis Unam, Doskovsky Was Right, and Lalek NPC. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon members. I think I skipped out on Mr. Cosman at the very beginning because I did not see his name pop up in the uh, Patreon feed, so I think he has vanished for now. Sad to see the old friend disappear like that, but oh well. <laughs> Come back whenever you can to support the channel if you wish. And if you want to be a Patreon member, you can in the link in the description down below. Join the channel. Join the Discord and all the other stuff that's on the Patreon. You know, fun stuff. See bloopers and uh, drawings and uh, take votes and other things that's happening in the channel. And if you like the video, leave a like and subscribe to the channel to see more content upcoming. I'm sorry this one took a little bit longer to record and get out to everyone. I have almost officially moved into the new home. Just a few more things left to do. Uh, and that'll be it. I could actually start getting more videos like this out into the world. Probably two videos a week if I am lucky. 
to have time and enough resources to do so. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed this one as much as I did, and again, thank you for watching another one of my videos. I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe out there, and have yourselves a good one. Bye-bye.